we're back. Our next speaker, David Robitaille, is ready. He'll talk to us about imaging from his backyard. Go ahead, David. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Dave Robitaille. Um, a little bit of history about me. Uh, pretty much, I grew up with a telescope in my hand. Some guys were cars. And, uh, my other girlfriends were uh, dolls. For me, it was a telescope. Um, However, I've never really got into imaging until a few years ago, and uh, it really re-energized my passion for this hobby that uh, with technology we have these days that we can actually uh, see things that uh, professional astronomers 30 years ago would have only dreamt of, and now we can do that with modern and modest technology in our own backyards. Um, so... Uh, it all started two years ago uh, with the construction of my observatory in the backyard. We decided, you know, that enough was enough to set up every night and back up every night and not deal with the mosquitoes and uh, being cold and freeze to death. Uh, so I said, no, the, the mistress, which is the telescope, as my wife calls it, uh, will now have a house. Uh, now what I love about it is that the telescope is always set up polar line ready to go. All I need to do is go and open the roof and turn on the switch and walk back inside the house and control everything from inside. In my slippers with a nice cup of coffee and no bugs to deal with. <laughs> uh, one of the downside of uh, the hobby, well, I think this picture was worth a thousand words. Um, you can really put in a lot of cash into this hobby, especially when you get into imaging, because obviously we always want to have the, uh, the best equipment, the highest resolution, the best optics, the best mount. So you can spend a few dollars. Um, when I started a few years ago, uh, I started with a very old dinosaur, as you can see here. That was a Mead LX200 that I picked up uh, in Barry, and uh, believe it or not, I actually used that telescope with an equatorial wedge and really started to, to learn uh, and understand the basics of uh, imaging. Um, and I'm, I'm actually proud that I have done that because I have learned with one of the most difficult instruments. Uh, I don't may, uh, know many people that actually uh, do imaging with an equatorial uh, with the uh, super wedge on the fork mount telescope like this. Uh, but this is how I learned. And because I, it was so difficult, uh, I have now moved on to uh, more modern equipment uh, with an equatorial mount and modernized the optics as well. And my God, this was just a shock how easy it is to do now. Uh, and again, probably because I've learned uh, the most difficult way to start. Uh, right now, I own a uh, equatorial uh, mount, a Skywatcher EQ6. Uh, the picture on the left here is a uh, eight-inch RASA, it's the new uh, optical systems that uh, just came out. Um, it is uh, very, very fast for imaging. Uh, the F ratio on this telescope is actually an F2, uh, which I believe is like ten times faster than uh, the telescope on the right, which is a, a standard. Um, on the C8, you can see that the camera is attached to the back end of the telescope. And the best I can do with this is to reach a uh, focal ratio of 6.3, where with the RASA telescope on the left, the camera is actually in front of the correcting plate. You don't see it now because of the two cap, but it's actually inside attached to the front. Um, I can actually start seeing uh, 17 mag galaxies magnitude galaxies with only a 30 second exposure. It is just fantastic how fast this instrument is. Uh, the camera that I use is a uh, ZWO ASI 294MC Pro. Uh, this camera has the ability to cool to 35 degrees below uh, ambient temperature. So example, let's see that it is uh, zero uh, degrees and uh, on a very cool night. Uh, you could actually bring it down to minus 35 degrees. It's a little more difficult uh, to cool the camera during the summer, um, but uh, winter time is pretty easy. And some people will ask, why do you want a camera to be cooled? Well, those uh, sensors that you can see on the right picture, uh, those kind of heat up very, very quickly when you're actually taking long exposure. The, 
they, they basically use a lot of power uh, and it will create a lot of arc current and noise. And by keeping the chip at a much cooler temperature, it basically eliminates a lot of this, uh, those artifacts and it makes the image processing after uh, much, much easier. Um, a little joke here. Oh, no, sorry, not now. <laughs> Uh, I also use a, uh, a guide scope. Uh, this one is a 60 millimeter um, that I have with a little uh, black and white camera. And what a guide scope is, if I go back to uh, a few slides back here, you can see the guide scope is actually mounted on each telescope here. And it's connected directly to the equatorial mount. And the main purpose of a guide scope, basically, it locks on a star, uh, but you will always have some imperfections into the, the equatorial mount here. Uh, polar alignment that may not be perfect. And, uh, you know, unless you want to spend $30,000 on an equatorial mount, you will not have a perfectly built mount. So the purpose of this tele uh, small telescope, the guide scope, it will lock on a star and it basically communicates with the mount, and it sees if the star is drifting a little bit to the left or to the right or up and down, and sends a signal to the mount, you gotta go back down, you gotta go to the left, you gotta keep there, you gotta move there. Uh, using a program called PHD, I believe it actually stands for Push uh, Dare Dummy or something like this, uh, but uh, it's quite efficient and it works great. This is a little common joke that I love between me and my wife. <laughs> and the experience comes with time. Uh, when you get started in astronomy, in uh, astroimaging, you, you will uh, have success and a lot, and a lot of failures. Uh, and then sometimes you just come up with a picture and like the one you see of the uh, uh, Triffid Nebula on the left, there uh, was one of my first greatest shots uh, with my 10 inch LX200 of this uh, nebula. And oh my God, was I ever proud of it. Look on the right, one year later, experience can do. Now I look back and say, how could I have been proud of that? But this is all experience that you acquire. Uh, it's uh, a lot of a learning curve, choosing the right optics, the right cameras, and uh, uh, I would say 75, 70% uh, 70 of the job really is lined up in the uh, processing of the image with uh, either picks and sites that people are using. Uh, I personally still use uh, Photoshop. Uh, I don't feel like to go out and learn a new software. I'm just starting to master Photoshop. But if you're putting the time and the effort and the hours to look at those two pictures, it speaks for, yourself, for itself and it's only one year apart. And I'm still today uh, performing and performing better, better month after month. I can see the improvement. There's another picture here of the Andromeda Galaxy from a year ago. And this picture that I took, uh, actually, no, sorry. First picture was taken two years ago. And the Andromeda Galaxy on the right was taken last summer at Starfish. Uh, and I can't wait right now for it to climb up a little bit better with my new NASA telescope. Start uh, basically taking some uh, some more uh, uh, collecting some more photons out of this target. So perseverance is the most important thing. Uh, I put up a little bit of a video here with some music. I do apologize for uh, the music not lasting through the whole video uh, because I have no idea what I'm doing with movie editing. It's a completely new uh, experience for me. I quite put this up together for this uh, uh, little tutorial here. Uh, so it will play some music, but then the music will stop and the uh, pictures will keep uh, scrolling down. So let's take a look at that.
This is a world of music stuff. The pictures will carry on a little bit. This is the iris with a wide angle. And this is a zoom inside with uh, a made inch telescope. This is the uh, Eagle Nebula. Here we have the Dumbbell Nebula, planetary. Here's the Whale Galaxy. The Witch Broom. Griffith Nebula. One of my favorites so far, the North American Nebula. Whirlpool Galaxy. M81. In a wheel. M82, the exploding galaxy. That is uh, the Needle Galaxy. Sunflower, I really like this one. I think I did a good job on that one. And the Sombrero. I took this one actually last week. This is the Pelican Nebula with the Rasa E. Here's the Horsehead Nebula. The Crescent. Tiny little object, the uh, Rain Nebula, the Fruit Loop, so we call it. The tulip. And that is it. Um, so two nights ago, I, I was actually very happy that the car that was able to clear one of my neighbor's tree. Uh, and and uh, I was able to finally get the car that I wanted to put my hands on for a long time, which it's called the uh, Dark Shark Nebula. Uh, it kind of looks like a shark uh, or a dragon, if you will. Uh, personally, I think it looks more like a dragon than a shark, but to whichever way you prefer. Uh, so that is about it for me. Any questions, anyone? Well, thank you. Uh, very, very impressive, uh, Dave. Uh, I, I wish we could have seen your images a little longer. <laughs> That's yeah, a, I know. It, it's uh, like I said, it, it's really, uh, I'm very inexperienced uh, with video editing. Uh, the, I'm sure there is a way to slow down how the uh, pictures are going. Uh, you know, I, again, I need more time to, to learn more software. It's yeah. just uh, kind of complicated to, to learn that from A to Z, but I'm sure I'll get there at some point. Very good. So let, let's go to questions. Uh, Blake, anything online? Uh, there, we have a couple of questions. Uh, one for me, uh, uh, Dave. What's your um, sky like? Your back, your backyard like? Uh, uh, do you have to deal with much light pollution and so on? Uh, I am actually very, very fortunate. Unfortunately, I have to deal more more trees than street lights. Uh, I live about uh, twenty five minutes north of uh, Mary, uh, in a little town called uh, Coldwater. Uh, the sky brawl up here is, I would say, uh, 4.5, which is very, very uh, decent. Uh, I can see the Milky Way splitting in those two parts. Uh, the Zenith, no problem. Uh, I can pick up M31 naked eye. Uh, actually, a few nights ago, while I was imaging the uh, shark nebula, I could actually even have a glimpse of the North American naked eye, which is doesn't happen all of them. Different how clear the skies here or the transparency is. Um, but yeah, it, it's, I'm in a village, I have streets around me, but uh, there's nowhere like you guys down in Toronto where you can really, the only thing you can see is almost the moon. Uh, here, I, I'm very, very happy to have the sky I have. Uh, I, I uh, remember those skies when I visited Jeff Garrity, yeah. Yes, I'm actually, Jeff uh, is, was living just uh, a couple of lines away from me here, yeah. Okay. Mm, missed um, the guy. Yeah, we all do. Um, Magnolia asked, uh, what have you found to be the most challenging part uh, getting into astro imaging? A uh, couple of things that are difficult is, first, if you have to really understand the astro mechanics of what's going on with the sky and how it moves to be able to, you have to take a picture of something that is constantly in motion and you have to have your camera 
aim at this thing for hours on to, to, to collect data to, to come up with a picture. Uh, that is one thing. So you that's why you need those little guide scope and so on. And uh, then you have to fight the environment, the dew uh, and uh, clouds. Sometimes you can have a cloud that will pass by while you're watching the hockey team downstairs and, and it just throws off your hiding. And uh, so you have to pay attention to these things. And I think the most challenging part of doing imaging for me was to learn how to process those images. Uh, and I think everybody that tries to do that at one point or another is we all want to overdo it. And, and you basically are killing the data instead of helping it. So if anyone wants to get into imaging, when it comes to processing, processing either with uh, PixInsight or with um, uh, Photoshop, just do it baby steps at the time uh, when it comes to stretching and doing the levels. Always just baby steps and compare and so on and save your picture as soon as you're happy, save it. Uh, because you can work on an image, it happened to me several times, you can work on an image for three hours and then you go, oh my God, I almost have it and it's almost perfect. And then you do that little tiny little mistake and you just destroy it completely. And then you just work three, four hours with absolutely nothing, you can start from scratch. So keep saving your, uh, your work as you go and as you process. So. Yeah, processing, I think, is the most challenging. Okay, very good. Um, I, I have a question for you, given that you yes. have so many fantastic images and you've shown uh, us them pretty quickly. Do you, <laughs> do, you have, do you have an online gallery? Do you put your photos? Uh, in uh, I do not at this point yet. Uh, however, um, I do share a lot of my uh, pictures on the... Uh, Facebook, uh, Starfest Facebook, if Paul is aware of that. Uh, I do share a lot of my pictures there. Uh, quite a few of us do that there. So yeah, more than welcome to look for uh, Starfest pay, uh, Facebook page and uh, you'll see my work there. All right, good. Uh, Paul asked uh, some details about the camera and I was curious too, is it a one shot color or is it a monochrome? No, it is a one shot color. Uh, it's, this is a big uh, a decision you have to make when you want to do imaging. Am I going to go with a mono, which is black and white, uh, or a one-shot color? Uh, you definitely can pick up quite a, quite a little bit more detail with a mono camera because they're more sensitive. Uh, but for example, now with the RASA, you saw this uh, picture of uh, the uh, shark nebula that I worked on a couple of nights ago. Uh, if I go back here, there we go. Uh, this, believe it or not, was only like 20 pictures of two minutes exposure stacked together. And uh, that's how quick this telescope can, can pick it up. And, and it's in color like that when you process. Uh, where with the mono camera, you need to actually take, let's say, uh, 20 pictures with a blue filter and 20 pictures with a red filter and 20 pictures with a green one. And then you need to combine all of that. So it's a lot more work into the boat processing. Uh, but there is different things you can do with mono cameras. Like uh, I believe the Hubble pellets, the, uh, like the telescope pictures can only be done with uh, those mono cameras and not with a one-shot color. Uh, but these days, uh, the one-shot color have, uh, have really, really come a long way. Uh, and here's the results right there with uh, the target. Uh, which you cannot see that at all with the naked eye. You really need some uh, some exposure, and the colors are very contrasty, as you can see the the yellow and orange stars and the blue ones are very very distinct. Yeah, looks really good, and it does make the processing a lot easier, I imagine. Uh, uh, well, it's much uh, much shorter. You know, you're gonna spend probably only one, basically with mono camera because of all the filters. I I, I think it's three times more work than with the color camera, but can you get better results with a mono? Uh, I, I don't disagree. Uh, I would think you can get better resolution and so on, and they are more sensitive, that's for sure. Bernard asked the question, he asked if the ASI 294 would be a good camera, he's thinking about getting one, for a long focal length scope. 
my answer to that would be yes, depending what kind of uh, long focal length are we talking about? Let's see, a Schmidt plastic grain or a long focal uh, refractor? Because uh, he didn't that could uh, that could make a difference. There is a website um, called, I believe, Astronomy Tools, if I'm not mistaken, where you can actually plot in the type of telescope that you have or that you may want to buy and then put in the type of camera that you have or may want to buy. And it will tell you exactly uh, where, uh, if it's good uh, for that type of telescope. Uh, right now for my C8 and especially for the RASA, uh, the 294 is one of the best camera there is to be with that telescope. Uh, other cameras will have the pixels too big or too small. You know, it, it's you have to have the right balance. So yes, that's actually a very good question. Uh, but that, I don't know, Paul. Uh, am I seeing the right place here? Astronomy tools. I believe that's what the website is called. When you can actually go and find these things out. Dave, do you do you want to um, uh, check that? We we don't need to know right away, but maybe mm -hmm. we can. Um, update everybody after and we can put it we can attach it to the the uploaded video so if you, can find, if you can find that out that'd be great I, I i think i've seen that website but i don't remember the address off the top of my yeah head. it's fantastic because it will tell you with, with this uh, camera and this telescope if you will be under sampling or over sampling and uh under what conditions uh, sometimes it will be a perfect match, but it will be a perfect match for good seeing conditions. Um, well, when do we up here in Canada see good seeing conditions? <laughs> uh, maybe one out of 20 nights, if that. So, you know, it tells you absolutely everything that you need to know. Which camera will be best at a moderate seeing or uh, poor seeing and so on. It's, it's just a great tool to you. So, yes, I will find out and send you the link. Okay, thanks. Uh, You're welcome. The the uh, camera is obviously cool, the one that you use, so that gets rid of a lot of noise. But do you still do some of the other things like take darks and flats? Oh, yes. yes. You, you need to uh, basically, uh, um, depending on what telescope you're using, there is those darks, there's those flats. Uh, I have noticed with the schmidt caster grains, the SCTs with the long focal lines at 6.3 or so on, I need to take some flats, uh, which basically is that a light picture with nothing on. Uh, kind of tricky to take, but uh, once you have it, you have it in the library. Uh, but sometimes you will have dust on your sensors and it will look like little donuts. Uh, and those flats will help removing this. Uh, the picture you see right now on screen of the uh, uh, Shark Nebula, uh, there's no flats at all. I've noticed with the RASA, I have no idea if it's because it's an F2 and I've been using it for a month now and doesn't matter how hard I process and over exaggerate the images, I have not seen a donut or a speck of dust yet. Uh, is it because it, it doesn't focus on it? I have no idea, but this is something I just learned for myself and I actually would like to talk about this on some forums if other people are using the RASA scopes at F2 are actually experiencing the same thing as well. There's no more bus bunny since I use that telescope. And if I put my camera on the C8, poof, they're back. But you can you can remove those with flats. Uh, there's also darks uh, because a camera like this will also create what we call uh, amp glow. Uh, so the longer your exposure are, it's going to be like a glowing rays on the side of the your image. Uh, and when you take darks, which basically a dark, if you take a two minute exposure for your light, you take, a, you put your cap on and you take um, a two minute exposure at the same temperature, that's very, very important, same temperature uh, of your light. And then you combine, for example, that picture here, I had 20 lights, I had 20 darks, and I also took 20 biases. Biases is the sh fastest exposure with the cap on that your camera can take, which is Mill it, uh, 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 not a hundred of a second, uh, and this actually helps removing as well the um, uh, hot and cold pixels uh, out of your image. So, 
when you combine all of these, those lights, darts, flats, and so on, and biases, it's called calibrating. So you usually a uh, uh, software called Deep Sky Stacker for doing that. It's actually free online. Uh, so you just put all your pictures in there and you click the button and it comes up with one final image that almost looked black and white with only two or three pictures. And then you go, oh my God, what happened? You know, I spent four hours taking a picture of this and it's gone. It's only three stars. But not panic. You can take that picture and you bring it to a processing software like Photoshop or Pix inside. And you start extracting the data and voila, it just starts coming out and coming out and coming out. And you just try to keep doing this um, until, you know, to keep it without having too much of uh, the noise coming out. That's the, uh, the enemy number one of an astral calendar is the noise. Because if there is noise and the more you try to process your, for example, the shark would be way much more appearing but then you're going to see all kinds of noise in there and it, it doesn't look good. It looks too grainy and so on. So yeah, lots of tools. Uh, there's also some plugins that you can download for a very modest price. Uh, to add on to Photoshop that are actually just created especially for uh, imaging. And all you have to do is click on one button. It will basically do in, in one minute what it would take you to do with Photoshop manually over an hour, an hour and a half. It's very, very uh, sweet, those old tools. Um, I don't remember the name. Uh, I think it's Carboni uh, tools. If I'm not uh, so basically, they are astronomy tools especially designed for Photoshop, and you just add it to Photoshop. All right, thanks for all those answers. Uh, You're that's welcome. It for, that's it for our questions. Take care. Thank you for having me, guys.